meet uh, Dekel, and we continued this to another project with, took some of our results and wanted to do some more things with them, but uh, unfortunately, both uh, Michael and Amit quit the field, and so I, have, I had to recruit uh, other collaborators, who are Diego Trancanelli and uh, Eduardo Vescovi, but, uh, you know, and we're all our uh, um, curious to see whether they will meet the same fate, but we have your counterexample on the second line that not all of my collaborators uh, uh, leave the field. Um, the, there is a big invariant of, uh, of this topic, and that is that I always promise that uh, this paper is coming in the next month. It has been an invariant for over a year now. So let's, let's try to break this invariant soon. Um, so let me start with some background and I'll get uh, to the topic. Um, the most beautiful, nice, uh, supersymmetric object at n equals four super young mills is the half BPS uh, circular Wilson loop. It preserves a subgroup of the conformal group, which is the rigid conformal group in one dimensions. And um, it, this is true for any conformal field theory, but for n equals four super young mills, it also preserves half of the supercharges, in particular this uh, supergroup, whose bosonic part is written here. And its expectation value is well known. It's given at finite n by this Laguerre polynomial and at large n by this Bessel function, modified Bessel function. Some of the things I'm going to discuss today are valid for all n, anything that you can get through localization. Some of the things I will discuss are valid only in the large n limit, those that you get uh, through integrability, for example. Um, but for simplicity, I will just work in the large n limit. If you want to do things at, large, at finite n, we can discuss it. So now that we know and understand and love the circle very well, and we already know it for many years, we can ask what our, we can do about deformations of the circle. So again, as a restriction, which is not necessarily, for some of the things it's, I'm doing it's necessary for some of the things it's not. Let me restrict the Wilson loop to be inside a two-dimensional plane, and then I can write it in terms of one complex function of a parameter theta, uh, where it's e to the i theta plus a small function g of theta. And I can assume this function is real, because if it's an imaginary, I can absorb that in a reparameterization of theta, so g of theta you should uh, the log of, uh, sorry, the exponent of g of theta is the radius of the deformed circle. And um, we can write a g of theta in a Fourier expansion and b minus n is equal to the complex conjugate of bn because it's a real function. And uh, now we can study what happens to the expectation value of the Wilson loop in a power series in these parameters b, or more generally in a power series in this function g of theta. And of course, at lowest order, we set g to zero. We just go back to the usual circle. As I will review, order b squared is also known at all orders in the coupling. It's related to the Bremsstrahlung function. So the new questions to ask are about order four and higher in this expansion. So this is one point of view. Another point of view is uh, the fact that you can uh, look at a Wilson loop and in insert operators into it. And there is this double bracket notation for these uh, expectation value of operators which are not really independent operators. What you should think about is you have a path-ordered exponential of this Wilson loop, and I'm taking here the BPS Wilson loop. 
And inside it, I'm inserting adjoint valued operators. Um, so you should think of an operator uh, at position S1, an open Wilson loop connecting the point S1 and S2, another operator at S2, another open Wilson loop, and so on up to here, and then another open Wilson loop from Sn back to S1. And this symbol just takes care of all of that. The path ordering puts these insertions in the correct place inside this path ordered exponential, or we can just write it like this. The simplest case is when the operator O is just one of the adjoint scalar fields of our theory, but it can be many other things, including the field strength. It should be clear that this has, these are not operators in the theory on their own. They are not gauge invariant. These are insertions. This is another sector of the theory that we can study. And really, the operator in general is the entire thing, but we can look at properties of these insertions. Now, this you can do for gauge invariance with any path, and you don't even need this uh, scalar piece here if you just worry about gauge invariance. In the case of uh, the, the case that I will study, I will include it, and I will take the path to be a circle, and I told you that the circle preserves an SL2R, a small conformal group, and this means that two-point functions satisfy the usual a structure of two-point functions in a conformal field theory. A, if they are primaries, they will have to have the same dimension, and it will be some number divided by the distance between them. A, to the power of the dimension, two of the dimension. Yes? If they are primaries, they have to, but if they are not primaries, if they are descendants, then it's, it's exactly the same as, in a, as with usual operators. Here I didn't assume primaries, so descendants can, a, can have that. A, for, but it, yeah, it's, uh, when you talk about primaries, it's always uh, one over the distance to two delta. Here, I wrote the distance on the, uh, on the circle. You can do this both on the circle and on the line. I will switch between these two pictures. It doesn't make uh, much of a difference when we talk about uh, this, uh, this question. The operators will have the same uh, dimensions and normalizations, and when we talk about three-point functions, the same structure constants. And you can go to four-point functions, you already then will have one real uh, cross-ratio. And uh, one can ask, uh, the, one can study this defect CFT and ask what are the uh, what are the dimensions, what are the normalization constants, what are the structure constants, and so on. Do everything that is done in the uh, bootstrap. So another question I want to ask is what can we say about these operators, these insertions? I will be casual in using the term operators instead of insertions, but you should always know that they are not independent operators. And how are they related to deformations of the circle? So now that I introduced everything, um, I can tell you what I'm going to talk about. So I will talk about first the relation between these last two transparencies, deformations of the circle and uh, the defect CFT, which is what we did in our uh, published paper. And I will tell you how you can study these, uh, uh, the CFT data, uh, the anomalous dimension and uh, structure constants. And I will mention how this can be done. Then I will go to study the uh, deformations of the circles. So first, at order 
a b squared or g squared, I will review the Bremsstrahlung function, and then I will discuss the case of a order four. And if I have time, I will mention these points about a string theory, which is part of the motivation for my work, but it's a bit technical, so when we get there, I'll explain it. Any questions so far? Mosquitoes here are eating me. Beware next speakers. So, um, so we can represent deformations of the circle in terms of operator insertions. Normally in a usual Wilson loop, if you add a small bump to the Wilson loop, it's essentially inserting one plaquette, and it's represented by a field strength in, with one direction parallel and one direction uh, normal to the Wilson loop where you make uh, the bump. If you take the circular Maldacena Wilson loop, then instead of F, you also get a piece involving the scalar. So that is the first lowest dimension insertion you can get. And this is actually also known as the displacement operator. It's what you get by acting with a displacement operator, a, a small geometric deformation of, uh, of your defect. Uh, more generally, operators are classified by representations of the uh, unbroken group. And, um, uh, well, we wrote in our papers a few of these uh, multiplets. It's not very enlightening, so I didn't copy them here. At classical dimension one, we have uh, the scalar fields. So, of course, this is dimension two. Uh, we have the six scalar fields, phi i, and they decompose into the singlet phi one, which matches the, the scalar in the Wilson loop, and a quintet of SO5. And the quintet is protected, and it's actually a super partner of this operator, and the singlet is not protected. Here are some operators uh, of dim dimension two. You see I have here many uh, of the field strength, uh, they are all field strength, but uh, because we have the line that broke some of the uh, um, Lorentz symmetry, they sit in different uh, representations of the preserved uh, SO3. And you also have derivatives of the scalar fields, either the singlet or the quintet, and you have things made out of composite uh, of the fields. Uh, of course, there are also fermionic insertions and all these things you can look at our paper. And we, to study the dimensions and normalizations and structure constants of these operators, we have many tools in our disposal. We have perturbation theory, which you can do explicitly to any order that you want. You can use ADS-CFT. We can use integrability. In some cases, we can use localization, and we can use the bootstrap. So one of the points I want to emphasize in my talk is that uh, this topic of the defect CFT of the Wilson loop is a rich laboratory where all these uh, topics in modern theoretical physics come together. And I will apply only a few of them in my talk. I will not use bootstrap. I will not use integrability, really. Um, in, in my talk, I mainly focus on perturbation theory, but uh, all the others can also be uh, implemented, and there have been people studying them from the other, uh, have been studying this defect Wilson loop CFT from other points of view. So let me mention the story of integrability. It hasn't been applied in this case, but it could be. Um, so a cusp Wilson loop you can calculate using integrability. Uh, both Diego and I 
figured it out. Um, so a Wilson loop in ADS-CFT is described by an open string and uh, strings in ADS-5 are, uh, ADS-5 process 5 are, are integrable and um, the open string in ADS then becomes an open integrable model and you need to understand what are the boundary conditions and so on, but the boundary conditions do preserve uh, integrability, the boundary young buxter equation. So uh, we're in good form. And, uh, but that is the case when, when, when you have a cusp in this story that I discussed so far, there was no cusp. But uh, the nice thing is that at the same, at the apex of the cusp, you can also introduce an insertion and for the question that I am studying now, what I would really want to do is leave only the insertion and take away the cusp so I have a straight segment or a circle with some insertions into it. The only insertions that were properly studied were uh, Z to the L's, where Z is, one of the, is a complex scalar field which does not involve phi 1. And uh, this is a protected operator in the absence of the cusp. In the presence of the cusp, it's an interesting operator and its uh, dimensions and so on uh, were studied and they're quite uh, involved. Uh, but there is closed form formula uh, for their expectation values. Uh, in, in the language, this is the ground state of the spin chain. If we want all other insertions, would be excitations of this state. So what I want to do really is study the, uh, the beta state for this system, uh, but this could be done. Integrability allows you to do it, but actually nobody has, uh, has gone through this procedure to calculate what is the spectrum of these uh, open string beta states. And this clicks. Okay, so that was about integrability. I mentioned what could be done and what has been done, but it's not exactly addressing our problems of the insertions into the circle. What has been done, and I will discuss a bit more, is to apply usual perturbation theory. And one can take any of these insertions and draw the relevant diagrams to calculate them. And, and this has been done. What we did instead was try to use the relation between smooth deformations of the Wilson loop and uh, insertions to calculate sm smooth deformations of Wilson loops and through them uh, find the properties of the, uh, of the insertions. So if you take an arbitrary curve which will be a deformation of the circle, at one loop you just get an effective propagator which involves exchange of gauge fields and exchange of scalar fields. Here you divide by the distance squared and this is the one loop expectation value of the Wilson loop. If your curves are in R2, there is also a compact formula for the two loop graphs which just is a, this formula this is the result of the interacting graph. These are uh, ladder-like diagrams that give these terms. And we have found efficient algorithms to calculate these integrals. Uh, and what we want to do is rewrite them and extract the CFT uh, data. So generically, if we have the curve of this form, We can expand it in a formal power series in G. And what we get at zeroth order, we get the circular Wilson loop. At first order, we get two G insertions and two, two powers of G and two displacement operators. Then at order G cubed, there is nothing really. At order G to the fourth, we have four displacement operators, and then some contact terms when two of these Gs are at the same point, which essentially involve 
d of f. So here is the expectation value of the Wilson loop written in a formal series which involves the CFT data, four-point functions, three-point functions, two-point functions, and more two-point functions. And what we want to do is take this, these expressions that we have here and repackage them in this form and through that read the information for these things. Now this involves quite a lot of work because it, uh, it, it requires manipulating these, uh, the integrals that we have uh, here. It also involves these expressions that we have here that we get from this expansion may not be the most natural objects in terms of the representation theory. So we may need to do some diagonalization and rewrite these guys in different way. Well, that's why I have PhD students who did that. And, uh, and then left the field. And uh, <laughs> what we get is that for the displacement operator, the normalization constant is given by this. This was already known from explicit calculations before. Some three-point functions that we found are the following, and three-point functions of a field strength all will have some tensorial structure because there are indices here, so you get these complicated tensorial structures. As far as I know, this tensor has not been written before, uh, this exact uh, combination. In principle, you can extract it from group theory, but uh, uh, I don't think this has been done. And we found the structure constant, which has not been known before. For the unprotected scalar, we found the anomalous dimension, which again is in agreement with previous calculations. And uh, for the triplet and quintet that I have here, um, we also have the same anomalous dimension as this, which is consistent because they are actually in the same multiplet, in the same super multiplet. I like these results so much that I wrote them on a pot. Here you see the small deformations, so if you don't know, I'm a potter on the side. And uh, here are all the uh, references, and if you feel that you're missing a reference, then do send me an email and uh, I will not add it to this part. I, I normally bring one to show to the audience, but that one is about this big. And I, I... So, the same story can be done in a ADS CFT, and this was done by uh, these people, and uh, what they did was study the ADS2 world sheet uh, theory of, um, of the circular Wilson loop. So the circle has a very, a very simple ADS dual where the string just takes the form of an ADS2 inside ADS5. And to calculate the fluctuation determinant, you need to expand the Green-Schwartz uh, action to quadratic order. Uh, for their purpose, they expanded it to the next order, to quartic order, and calculated um, Witten diagrams in this ADS2 effective theory and interpreted it um, in terms of uh, the bootstrap to extract some uh, structure constants for two scalar fields combining into some uh, composite, two scalar insertions combining into a composite of two scalar fields, and they found expressions uh, like this, and they have many, many more of them. So one can use also ADS-CFT and the bootstrap to extract these uh, anomalous dimension for the scalar field, uh, for the singlet, and structure constants. So there are some things to do here and other tools. 
So this is what I wanted to say mostly uh, about these uh, operator insertions. Now I want to switch to the deformations uh, of the Wilson loop, the smooth deformations. Any questions so far? Okay. So we have this expansion of the, we have a general curve which we write in terms of the function g and I told you that at quadratic order you have two g's and two insertions of f. Now the operator f is special because it's a protected operator whose dimension is two. It is in the same multiplet as the quintet of scalars who have protected dimension one. So we know that this two-point function will always be one, of the dis one over the distance to the fourth power times a number, and that number is the Bremsstrahlung function. So I wrote here, I replaced this by B of lambda divided by the distance to the fourth power. And then you have this integral, which you can write in the Fourier basis, like this in terms of Bn. Remember, Bn are the Fourier coefficients of G. Now, I will not tell you how, but it's a very clever trick uh, on how you can find the Bremsstrahlung function by a different deformation of the circle that preserves supersymmetry and then uh, relate it to a, a supersymmetric deformation of the circular Wilson loop whose expectation value you know exactly and that gives you the Bremsstrahlung function in this form as the, in the large n limit. And uh, you can take this for this arbitrary deformation that you have here and plug this function, this coupling dependence into this formula. And of course, this is consistent with the explicit calculations that I wrote before. This AF that I write here is just the expansion of this Bremsstrahlung function to first two orders in lambda. So we know the expression W2 exactly, the dependence on the Fourier coefficients and the dependence on the coupling is completely determined. So now we want to go to order W to the fourth, a, a B to the fourth. And um, this is the expression which last week I think I found some mistakes in it, but uh, that's okay. Um, I mean, they're correct in our Mathematica code, but in, in the way we translated the Mathematica code to the draft, we made some mistakes, so don't take a photo of this. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> okay, mistakes are allowed along the way. It doesn't really matter. Um, so this is at one loop. This is order lambda. And these are all b to the fourth power. So you get c here, bn cubed, b minus 3n. Uh, you have b, this is bn, b minus n, bm, b minus m. We actually did this uh, for two loop order. It's much more complicated. Uh, again, you get some, you get the same b's appearing, but the coefficients are harmonic numbers. It's, uh, it's pretty nasty. And we're still trying to study the structure of these expressions and correct them, uh, write them correctly. Um, but staring at them, there are all kinds of structures in there. So, this is the expression at, at order b squared. This is what we had, which is much more compact. And the entire lambda dependence just factors out into this expression. Here at the next order in lambda, we don't get anymore this polynomial. 
rational, uh, natural number polynomial, we get instead harmonic numbers. So it gets very complicated. Um, so are there any structures at this order? We do think that there are. And let me give you some hints to that. And that comes from studying uh, the near circular Wilson loop in ADS CFT. So I will not review it, but you can, uh, well, just this transparency. To study uh, Wilson loops in R2, you need uh, to look at strings propagating in ADS3. Do that uh, an efficient way is to use the Pohlmeyer reduction. And uh, then you end up with a generalized Koch-Gordon equation where f is equal to 1. This is just a Koch-Gordon equation where given a function f, you need to solve for uh, alpha. Uh, given f, you solve for alpha, and then you find uh, that the action, regularized action of the string is given by this integral, which you can evaluate. And the shape of the Wilson loop is completely obscured in this description. I just have these functions f of alpha, but you can reproduce it. Uh, there is an algorithm to also calculate the shape of the Wilson loop, but I'm, I'm not writing it for you. And in the case of the circle, f is equal to zero. Alpha, you immediately solve to be that. And the case that I want to study is the near circle, so I will take f to be small of order epsilon and study things in a power series in epsilon. Now, you should note that these two formulas Finding alpha does not involve the phase of F, and the area also does not involve the phase of F. But you should believe me that the shape of the Wilson loop depends on the phase of F, if I construct it in this way. And uh, you need to choose one, uh, you need to choose a prescription. But uh, so we have a family of Wilson loops which are related to each other by phase, by multiplying F by phase whose expectation value at strong coupling, the area of the string world sheet, is the same. Now, you can use that and evaluate the string action as a power series in epsilon. And what you find is the following expression. At order epsilon squared, you get some function of p, which these are the uh, Taylor coefficients of this function f and something with a p squared. At order epsilon to the fourth, you find a very compact formula with things of order a to the fourth. And note that the fa overall phase doesn't appear here because I have here a and a bar, and here everywhere I have two a's and two a bars. So if I multiply f by a constant phase, this will cancel. Come on. So we can write the shape of the Wilson loop in a power series in epsilon, relate f and b, and at lowest order b is equal to this thing where phi is this phase. So the shape of the Wilson loop will depend on the phase of f on this curly phi. And now if you take this expression, a you see here 1 over n times n squared minus 1. So in the expression for the, um, at order b squared, we had everywhere, we had a b times b bar times a n times n squared minus 1. If we want to translate it to an expression in terms of a, what we will find is exactly this expression. 
So this is consistent with this uh, universal behavior for the order b squared. Uh, but we can also plug this and the higher order terms into the expression that I had, the corrected expression that I had for uh, order b to the fourth. And then we find an expression in, at order a to the fourth, which is this. So this is at strong coupling. Uh, Sorry, this is at weak coupling. I just plug this into my weak coupling expression and what I find, a, sorry, this, I plug, I find this expression. So this is at weak coupling, order lambda. We get this, which reproduces the Bremsstrahlung function once we translate A to B. And we get this expression. And note, that even though this is at weak coupling and this is at order uh, a to the fourth, we don't get here any dependence on this curly phi that I had before. So, and this is remarkably simple, similar to the strong, calcula strong coupling calculation that I had here. It's just, it's the same denominator and just a different polynomial in the numerator this expression. So this is at weak coupling, at strong coupling we have a very similar expression. And this is not related to the Bremsstrahlung function, this is at order a to the fourth power. So in Amit's paper who studied this relation between uh, these kinds of relations, he observed many examples that there, at weak coupling, there was no dependence on this phi in the expectation value of the Wilson loop up to order epsilon to the eighth. Not including, it starts at order epsilon to the eighth. Here, we proved that at order epsilon to the four, there is no dependence on this phi. So there is this extra secret symmetry whose origin we still don't understand, which extends from strong coupling and is, a, exists at one loop order and also at two loop orders, but I didn't write the expression here. There is no dependence on this, uh, on this phase, so this family of Wilson loops related by this phase phi have the same expectation values at these orders. At strong coupling, this is known as a symmetry. At weak coupling, this is not a symmetry. It's an approximate symmetry whose origin we don't understand yet. As I told you, uh, Amit didn't find examples with dependence at order epsilon to the six, but we did. His uh, analysis was not, uh, he was just looking at some examples. Uh, looking at more examples, we did find dependencies at order epsilon to the six. So there you will already get expressions which don't involve just A, A bar, A bar, A. You're gonna get combinations within different numbers of A's and A bars, and they will have explicit dependence on the phase. So for the new project, I made also some pots, and you see here this, whether you take a photo of it or not, this is already burnt and in the kiln, so it has the wrong formulas on it, but <laughs> my customers don't mind, they don't know. And it's supposed to represent a draft, it's fine. So let me conclude. Uh, the circular Wilson loop is an ideal lab to study defect CFT. One can use perturbation theory, localization, integrability, uh, the OPE techniques, and uh, bootstrap, and uh, ADS uh, CFT. We are calculating the expectation values of the deformed circular Wilson loops or alternatively insertions into the Wilson loop and there is an explicit, even if complicated, map uh, between them. We have explicit results uh, for anomalous dimensions and the general expression for the deformation. 
uh, at certain orders in, at one loop, two loops, and strong couplings. Uh, we have dimensions, structure constants, and so on. There is a surprising independence on the spectral parameter uh, curly phi, the phase, uh, at order epsilon to the fourth, we don't understand. And uh, the fact that this strong coupling expression and weak coupling expression are so similar is also puzzling to us and we want to understand it. And um, the nice thing is that I didn't do here really anything too novel uh, or sophisticated and this calculation could have been done 20 years ago in the age of when Wilson loops and ADS-CFT were invented and um, yeah, I was just using perturbation theory and very basic ADS-CFT. So we can still find surprises in basic ADS-CFT calculations. Thank you.